So what are we going to call this? It's Manning Creek. These researchers from the Missoula Fire Lab are doing something they almost never get to do. Hey, are we turning things on? They're setting up cameras and heat sensors right at the edge of a future wildfire to measure how far away from a blaze firefighters need to be to stay safe. Good morning. Um, hey, thanks for just coming to help us out with this project. It's uh, large scale. It's all part of a first of its kind study called FASMI, or the Fire and Smoke Model Evaluation Experiment. A lot of technical words that mean, basically, the Forest Service is going to burn this entire forest down and measure what happens with drones and remote sensors. You can't go out there and just collect smoke. You can't just go out there and collect soil. What you really need to do is you need to collect that suite of information that actually characterizes the fire. My biggest concern is safety. There's a lot of people here. There's close to 40 of us. I, <clears throat> we probably will see fire behavior today that's going to be extraordinary. And uh, I just want everybody to understand the significance and the danger of what we're going to be doing. It could be a dangerous day, but it's also a necessary one. Last year, wildfires in the U.S. caused tens of billions of dollars in damage, including one that swept through Paradise, California, killing 85 people. Scientists like Craig Clements say that until now, it's been nearly impossible for researchers to get close enough to big burns to effectively study them. How much do we know about fires? We're pretty good with grass fires. Grass fires are very simple. They're a homogeneous fuel. It's the big wind events, the fires that have long range spotting. A spot is a ember that's blown in the wind far distances downwind and starts a new fire. And when you have lots of embers landing, like in paradise, you're starting new fires ahead of the fire, main fire front. So we have no capability of forecasting that. So that's one of the critical things that we are trying to get at. Understanding a prescribed fire like this allows us to apply that to the bigger, larger, um, more epic wildfires. Which, which I guess are coming. They're, they're yeah, increasing they're, in frequency. they're happening now. Are we prepared enough for our forest fire future? I don't think so. Here we go, it's starting to light up. 2,000 acres is a lot of forest to burn. To do it, the Forest Service is using special diesel torches mounted on the back of ATVs. I'll, be, I'll try and uh, run a strip a little bit lower on this next path. That and they've called in helicopters, which drop a napalm-like substance across the trees. So we're sampling just for five minutes now in the smoke because the filters fill up. We've got like a really small window and we try to get as many samples as we can per burn so things get kind of intense. And just working in fire, you know, it's, it's always intense. You always have to have your attention in two or three different places at once. What is that, like, that darker black smoke versus this? Like, what is, what is that? what's going on with that? So that's, that's more of a, like, uh, burning the carbon out of it. You're getting the, the white stuff is the fuel moisture coming out of it. And when you're getting down to that darker smoke is the actual, like, the tree trunks are burning. Is it weird to be lighting one? No. This year, mid-April, we were doing prescribed fires in my home state. I, I, it's what I do during the winter. If you're in the fire business, yeah. you spend half your time lighting fires, yeah. and then the other half putting them out. Right. Seems like right. there are cases where more fire is better, and we're, we're learning that. We've got two minutes left of sampling. I just put out some embers on the mat and just outside the mat, so we got to watch this shit. Okay. We can delay for a little bit. Oh, wow. It's gonna come straight down to the edge of the fire though, just so you guys know if we can get smoked in here for a second. It's gonna get smoky. Okay. No need, no need to panic, it's just gonna get smoky. Yeah. This is like the more intense moment. Single file. Single file. Vehicle from the front! Vehicle! 
Pop up the road! I'm right here with you. That's pretty intense. It, it got sporty for a second there, for sure. What was going on? What, what was happening there? So they lit off the backside of the ridge, got pretty established, and it was coming up. It was just be building heat on the top of it until it kind of got to a pocket that was burning on top, and it lined up with the wind in such a way that it was just blowing right towards us. We were getting a lot of ember sparks kind of come down, and that black smoke was just going to eat us alive. On my worry meter there, you know, it didn't really edge you too, but um, and on my snot meter, it was going a lot, <laughs> lot more. Is this a good fire? That was some good fire behavior. The following morning, the team from Missoula went to see if any of their instruments survived the fire. This looks like it was an extreme success. So this is probably the most extreme fire you've ever seen in these, isn't it? It's unique to get, you know, to get data like this, yeah. for sure. So are you able to learn anything just from what you're seeing here? Oh, yeah. It tells you a lot about how fuels respond to fire. So for the data we're collecting, that's really valuable because the implications of safety and safety zones and firefighter safety and what constitutes um, a safe environment. How quickly and how many of these kind of studies do you think it'll take before you're actually able to translate that into something that might change behavior of firefighters? You know, as scientists, our job is to gather data and make sense of it and, and prove scientifically what we believe is a safe environment. And I think that's the starting point. If you're really going to change a culture, it starts through an organic process.